So this morning, with the time I have, I'm going to depart a little bit from what you would traditionally, what I guess I would traditionally talk about. So what, what we're not going to dive deep into very much is you know, some specific piece of tech as it relates to cyber operations, or frankly talking about some new adversary technique or new, some new particular uh, attack approach. Instead, what I want to do is, is use the time to step back a little bit and kind of think big picture about organizations and how they successfully, honestly, react to new tech or how they react to specific adversaries and build on all the expertise we have here in the CERT Coordination Center of helping organizations, honestly, do, do their business. If, uh, if I was writing a self-help book, uh, I think the title of my presentation would be uh, Habits of Highly Effective Cybersecurity Organizations. And so kind of a lot of this is really just kind of vignettes for things we've seen organizations do. And as you hear me talk about stuff, in no sense should you say, okay, I'm going to work through a room in slides and it's a checklist and you know, I need to work through the ch checklist to consider whether I have all those things. That would be the wrong way to, to listen to the things I'm saying. Uh, frankly, some of what I will say will be contradictory because, again, I'm talking about the experiences that different organizations have had. And while I use the term cybersecurity organizations, like, what that covers is very, very broad. Uh, and, you know, that changes depending on what sector you're working on. That changes, honestly, the size of your budget, the size of your organization, and, frankly, what your management's told you to do. So, again, what I'm hopeful is that you'll hear me talk about kind of specific themes. Some of those will resonate with challenges that you have, and you can hear about how different organizations have kind of faced that and from our perspective, uh, how they've been successful working those issues. So the CERC Coordination Center, as, uh, as Greg previously spoke about, has been around since 1988. And we have historically been in the business of helping organizations that do cyber ops pretty much bringing better analytics. So we're trying to make their analysts better. And where appropriate, we're working on coming up with kind of niche tech that isn't readily kind of available that fills a gap for said operations center. We work substantially with the, the U.S. government, the industry, and largely focusing on the critical, critical infrastructure and bringing all of that together. Since we come from the Software Engineering Institute, it shouldn't surprise you that we're also very heavily invested in software quality. So from one perspective, I mean, what we want to make sure is that there's less vulnerabilities fielded so that products honestly don't ship with vulnerabilities. But, you know, the, the reality is we're all in the business. It happens. And so what do we do about it? So to the degree that the death rate of vulnerabilities can be increased. And lastly, there is substantial expertise in the market. You can go buy lots of really great security products. And honestly, if you need a contract for those services, lots of service providers will help you there. One of the remaining kind of themes as we think about how we bring the community together is we want to make sure that on the international level that countries can, can come together and work, uh, work security incidents and work policy issues overall. So the, one of the recurring themes we've had is working to make sure that internationally there's a community of computer security incident response teams for, that have national responsibilities. So every country, in a sense, has a belly button. To give you a sense of kind of where we're coming from in terms of the work we do, uh, on an annual basis, we work with approximately 700 software vendors of some kind. So a vendor can be uh, somewhat very large, like a, I think Microsoft, Oracle, or Google, or down to some open source project that has a particular library. And we help bridge the security researchers that are finding vulnerabilities and bringing that to the vendors. And in cases where a particular vulnerability affects lots of different products, we coordinate disclosure across those vendors. So I was just talking to our, our vault team yesterday, yesterday afternoon to get some numbers. And, you know, coincidentally, a nice round number. They tell me uh, we are sitting on about 45 vulnerabilities right now that we're coordinating with industry. And that correlates to about 51 CVEs across around 100, 150 different vendors uh, that, you know, in, in, the, in the next couple days all the way to a couple months from now, we'll be kind of disclosing that through the National Vulnerability Database. To give you a sense of the, the amount of data we're often looking at with our analytical approaches, depending on the week, we're looking from anywhere between you know, 550,000 unique malware samples surging up to sometimes a little under a million that we're triaging looking for interesting features and trends. For some of the larger network, uh, network sites where we're looking at that particular data, we're seeing some sometimes on the order of as many as 15 billion flows a day. And where guys are implementing some of our DNS analytical approaches, something on the order of 170 million unique resource records for passive DNS. And pervasively, we're involved in almost every critical infrastructure sector, 
And again, the talk that I have is really the history of helping organizations do their mission and helping kind of, in some cases, actually form some of, the, some of these new uh, computer emergency response teams. One of those interesting parts of my job has honestly been seeing how, how different organizations do it. So watching the difference between uh, a SOC operate in a profit center versus a cost center, watching how the government does it with, uh, in, perhaps in the DOD, with access to, to real intelligence information versus uh, uh, some mom and pop small business owner, you know, what resources do they have to kind of do it, and seeing the challenges that they have, which sometimes are common, but scale sometimes makes them really different. And so that's really the first theme that I wanted to talk with you guys about, and it's a little bit of a soft one. Overall, the success of a lot of SOCs ultimately comes down to the crispness of their mission, how well they really understand what they're doing, and how well the parties that they're serving, their constituency, really understands what, what they're doing. So if your stakeholders think you're doing something different than what you're doing, it's a real problem. And one of the other challenges we've seen is that very rarely is a security organization operating in isolation. Very often, they're operating in some kind of federated model where they perhaps are the organization that's at the, at the bottom of the organization where they're largely ha happening, managing a particular department or enclave, all the way up to organizations that operate at, at, the, at the top level. And how those organizations respond to, those different SOCs respond to, what those relationships are in the organization also has a tendency to indicate ultimately how successful they'll be. Successful SOCs, in our experience, spend a really a lot of time figuring out those organizational relationships and really making sure that their stakeholders understand what they've signed themselves up for and what they're really supposed to be doing. So where, where we see challenges occur is if you have a compliance organization that's largely now being, uh, being, being, being kind of accused of not for perhaps knowing about the, the latest and kind of greatest threat when that's not really part of the policy structure that they are operating in. Or watch and warning organizations whose job it is to bring together the big picture for an organization. They're being called to task about you know, why particular boxes haven't been patched in a particular way or about specific individual compromises that need to be cleaned up. So again, from the outside, successful organizations have messaged you know, what they're trying to do. And secondly, they've built those relationships with their partners to be successful because, again, most SOCs are successful through partnerships. So one of, the, one of the things you always want to make sure as you run one of these organizations is that you don't have to do a lot of begging and pleading, for example, for data. Uh, you know, successful organizations that are in the SOC function have really good relationships with the NOC elements and the system administrators that can touch specific boxes. And they're sensitive to the fact that different relationships are most effective. Of course, you know, if you're outsourcing things, having type type in tight and crisp contractual kind of specifications, but also realizing there is a place for formality and organizational relationships, and honestly, at the personal level, to just get honestly things done, perhaps with your ISP. And thinking also a little bit big hat, even working across competitors in forums like ISACs to, to realize that you're facing all the same common problems and you can learn from each other. Pulling on that same thread a, a little bit, you know, successful organizations, SOC organizations, understand how they fit into the overall business. So there's a tendency sometimes when SOCs find religion about process, uh, what they'll do is they'll worry quite a lot about, for example, about counting. So it, it comes down to how quickly did I open and close that ticket? How, how many boxes did I actually find compromised? And how quickly did I do remediation? And all of that's important, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But let's not lose, honestly, the, the forest for the individual trees. Individual pop boxes only matter to the degree that the mission is impacted kind of overall. So successful SOC organizations have some ability to understand what is the individual role of, of, of systems. And for large organizations, I readily admit that's exceedingly hard. Uh, speaking from so, some of my federal civilian experience, I mean, when you're talking about, you know, a thousand, I'm sorry, a, a thousand uh, desktops in a particular organization, extremely reasonable that you can get some sense of what those boxes are doing. When you're talking about a million at a much larger cabinet level agency, exceedingly hard. So SOCs that have thought through those problems have, have, have really kind of said there needs to be a surrogate for understanding what those boxes do. And it comes down back to what I spoke about earlier. It's about relationships. So you may know, not know what every individual box does, but you have a network sufficiently, you know, sufficiently in place that you can reach out to find out, you know, what every enclave is doing. You can get down to someone that can explain to you what, what happens. 
security guys shouldn't be the last thing to know about what the business is doing. So to the degree that the, the SOC is kind of aware of larger initiatives, in a, in a corporate environment, if there's some big rollout of a particular product in a new geographic area, the, the SOC guys shouldn't ultimately find out, they're, they're, find out much later the fact that there's a big surge of traffic from a particular set of countries uh, hitting kind of the web servers. That might be perceived as an attack. So knowing uh, ahead of time and kind of being involved makes them really smarter and ultimately more successful. Kind of to, to run an exemplar of that is is a data breach uh, is a data breach kind of example. So beforehand, the SOC really should have some idea of where your high value assets are, and this goes back to understanding what the business really is and where the business is doing uh, the vast majority of their work. And to the degree that you understand where those data containers are, so you treat those differently than you might treat uh, something perhaps like a, a test and eval evaluation network. And the SOC is ultimately involved in, hopefully, and you hopefully have one of these, a, some kind of damage assessment process to really understand what is the business impact for perhaps this compromised machine. So bring it from the technical perspective to uh, a business context. And to jo drop down to a very, very technical level detail, one of the things we've seen really high, uh, highly successful organizations do is be able to answer when a data breach occurs what actually left the organization because that's the fundam fundamental data you need to start talking about the damage assessment, how you're going to be reacting to what, what left your organization. And hopefully you can do that before, for example, it appears on Pastebin or it's in the news in some other way. And so one of the most successful ways we've seen organizations do that is, of course, have a good good censoring infrastructure, but also have a deep bench of reverse engineers that can build customized traffic decoders to that, that kind of deal with how the malware actually exfiltrated the, the information. You're going to hear me talk quite a lot about this, but your biggest asset in your organization is not the processes you have. It's not the tech you have. It really is the people you have in your organization. Now, in almost any, any ops organization, you know, whether it's you know, very, very large or really kind of small, there will be either one or two, or sometimes you're lucky enough to have a handful or two of your senior expert analysts. They set the tempo for what you do. And in an ideal world, you would have a lot more of them. And I encourage you to try to hire them, as many of them as you can. But that turns out to be really difficult. Uh, so how do you take the expert knowledge about how to do ops and get that imbued in, 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 in all your tiers of, of operation? One of the most successful things we've seen organizations do is make sure you have tightly bound some kind of development organization to the ops organization. So the thinking goes as follows. You have... Highly trained analysts in a highly repetitive business that are highly marketable. You want those guys to stay. You would want your senior analysts to at best maybe do something maybe 16 or 17 times before they say kind of enough. And we can ask the question of, well, maybe, maybe this can be automated in some way. So giving them access to someone that can script or hopefully in more production way, operationalize what they're doing every day uh, is a way to have them focus their attention on really what, what, they're best, uh, what they're best at. I will kind of caution you as you bring development expertise to, to, to guys that may know how to script, there will be a little bit of a tension, uh, and it is a tension about how well something should be coded to bring it into operations, but you can ultimately uh, solve all of that. When you're thinking about what the next thing you should be working on, you may be really good at today's threats with, with today's processes, asking the question of, well, who's thinking about the things over the horizon? Who's thinking about new ways to do what you're already doing? And giving your expert analysts access to a lab, and, and also it turns out the key element of that lab is actually uh, something like test data, a test sensor that gets live data in which in a safe harbor environment, they're able to explore different ways to do what they already do now or to figure out whether something else needs to be introduced in that pipeline. And that will give you your, your, steady, your, your steady stream of things to think about of what you want to put in your, in your acquisition process. And lastly, pulling on that theme of automation, independent of you know, whether you have development and engineering resources backing them, you already have a large amount of automation that's already occurring with your sensoring infrastructure. So create as few barriers between what the analysts want to look for 
and your existing kind of sensing infrastructure, if you can reduce that, you can be looking more quickly and more pervasively across your enterprise for what the analyst thinks the analyst think is the hottest thing to be looking at. So let them be involved in loading the sign in deciding what gets loaded as signatures and ultimately what you're filtering filtering for in your enterprise. Organizations that treat everything that happens to them as a new or novel thing will really be very sad over time because you will not have enough resources to kind of work those problems. So to what degree can institutional memory be preserved uh, across, uh, across analysts as they lead? And to what degree can you facilitate coordination, you know, analyst to analyst dialogue, uh, will also dictate how successful you are from, about learning from the past. Things we've seen work really well for analyst to analyst coordination is some way for them just to trade what they're thinking about, how they've solved kind of problems, and have the more junior guys observe how the more senior guys uh, approach things. So what we've seen work really well, above and beyond perhaps a ticketing system that you have, is things like, things like mailing lists that are archived and searchable, wikis that... Uh, wikis that, uh, that, that distill the, the experience you've had from specific events and specifically in tickets into, into a knowledge base of some kind. And thinking forward, and we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later, you know, think ahead about the metrics that you want to be generating in the future and make sure you label your data on the ingest side uh, that it's easy to ultimately kind of find and, and pop out. You want to spend a bunch of time categorizing and labeling the, the, the data you have and the highest value things we've seen over time is thinking really hard about how you manage all the indicators that you have in all your different sensor tech, your proxies, your, your IDSs, uh, and your, your host-based kind of monitoring system. Really having some way to reason about them, not as silos, but in, in some unified way. And the other kind of key part is having some way to reason about aging out that you're not always looking for, for the same thing. The, a malware repository from various forensics investigations and things you pull off from, from, your, from your email parsing and also from your IDS and IPS. And putting that all in one place is one of your unique abilities to say how you're being, how you're being targeted. And that informs uh, all, all sorts of kind of acquisition and network design uh, considerations. But it also tells you how you should be really focusing your resources. Now... It, any organization is going to have some class of upstream reporting, and reporting is going to come into the organization. And that's one of the ways in which you're going to find out what's happening. Well, how do you get high-class reporting? High-quality reporting uh, is, is, is a bit of a challenge. So how do you create incentives for the folks that have to tell you stuff to tell you stuff in a way that's readily and easy for you to use? I could stand up here and say the answer is, you know, well, you want to have kind of standards, uh, standards, codified ways to report, report things kind of in the same way. But one of the things we, we've ultimately found is it's really about the effort. What is the effort it, it takes to report something? So if you are in a hierarchical organization where some element, uh, you know, perhaps the, the top level kind of SOC uses one set of workflow and one set of tech and all the different SOCs underneath it that are reporting in some way are honestly using some other kind of piece of tech and there's some mandate to report from the bottom to the top, I mean, really ask yourself, how much effort is the guy that has his own system to do his work going to spend into dumping into some other system that actually doesn't help him? So the, to the degree that the reporting process actually brings value to the, report, the reporter and to the degree to which you can maybe have the same workflow used in some way or there's automation between those systems, that it's not a hand jam or kind of a swivel operation, you're going to get higher quality reporting and everyone's going to be benefit from that experience. So I'm going to take a breath here uh, and turn to Shane to bring some of the questions that may have occurred uh, as I've been speaking. Great, yeah. So people with our discussion theme from Jorge asking, are you involved with organizations by their request, or do you solicit your services out to outside organizations? We typically, so it's, a, it's kind of a great question, and that speaks to our business model as an FFRDC. Uh, organizations typically come to us that they need help that they need help with some kind of particular thing that they they think we can uh, we can bring to them there's also kind of cases where we feel like there's gaps in our knowledge or understanding of how how a particular sector or a particular class of organization does something and in that particular case i mean we do go out to to other organizations just to honestly get smarter about how they do their business okay next from eric asking how do you see developments proceeding 
regarding metrics for effectiveness of incident response activities, CSERTs. Are those measurements derivative or informative to cybersecurity program efficacy? Absolutely. I mean, kind of step one, and you're kind of beating me to the punch kind of later, is you should have some class of, uh, some class of metrics. Uh, if, if you haven't kind of found religion in, in an ITIL or an RMM or done something related to CMMI, you want to have... You want to have some basic process because it speaks to you know just being able to in a repeatable way measure something. Uh, kind of the, the other kind of dimension is it's kind of the evolution of it. Ultimately, there's no easy answer about what what those metrics should be for your organization. As I said earlier, there are different classes of organizations. You can be a compliance organization. You may be a line security organization. You may be a watch and warning organization. And you know those the metrics that actually matter. Uh, you know, frankly. There, I mean, it's not a one size fits all. So yes, I think there will be uh, an evolution there. But you know, one should really be asking, you know, what's the business and what's driving kind of the business, and make sure whatever incident response metrics you have are ultimately tied to 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 the business metrics. Okay. My apologies to anybody being blinded by my head as I read questions because they may be seeing the top of my forehead. But uh, we're, we'll do the best I can here. So from Mahendra asking, what kind of reporting governance or compliance tool? Will you suggest for better responsiveness output? Let me know if you need a repeat of anything. Yeah. So uh, I, again, I don't, I don't think I have a, a very specific tool answer because, again, as I previously was saying about the metrics, it's really less about the tool than it really is about the metrics. So whatever you think that can reasonably do the knowledge management for you, and it's erring on the side of it being easy to do the data elicitation will be kind of success for you. It's you know the, the the kind of the idea of metrics is really less a tech problem than really a culture and a policy problem. So it's first a matter of can you enumerate what it is that you want to measure, what what it is that you want to count, and then you work backwards. Where do I need to find that data? Making the right investment so that data is kind of possible. And you know there are. I mean, frankly, at that point, almost anything work can work because you've done the hard work about thinking about what should be dis driving your decision making. Okay, can we get one more in before we move on? From Mark asking, how many corporate and critical infrastructure InfoSec organizations are actually embracing a true intelligence lifecycle approach to dealing with information collection, analysis, dissemination, and feedback? Well, uh, the definition of true uh, is, is, sub is subject to debate. I think organizations that are at least participating to some degree in, in ISACs have recognized that there is a need to look outside to understand what your security posture is. It, kind of the, the overall kind of idea about kind of security intelligence, buying kind of threat feeds, is is a growing uh, is a gr is a growing realization by a lot of organizations. So I, I wouldn't say that that pervasively is is understood by everyone, but it absolutely is on, on the uptick. Okay, we can go ahead. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, so kind of moving on a little bit, uh, very closely related to this idea of knowledge management is this, this question of kind of triage. So I previously was talking about save all the data you have historically. It's valuable to you. But at the other end, you, know, you have guys saying, no more data. I have so much. What am I supposed to be responding to? And it's a kind of a very basic thing. You know, so which one of all the things that I, have, I could possibly be working on, which sample, which event, which incident, which compromise is the most important one? Where do I even start with all of this? So two things really will help you kind of reason about that. The first one is uh, what I opened with is, you know, to what degree can you, can you define what's mo most important to your business? Where are the key assets to your boxes? Which systems, which processes are the key business drivers kind of for you? And focus on, focus on really where security events have happened uh, that happened in a way that would impact those processes. And secondly, look at history. History will tell you also how worried or how involved you should be getting in some of this. So uh, kind of th thinking about kind of history and kind of business context, if something is targeting your t test and evaluation network versus perhaps something that's generating your revenue, I mean, I would start with the latter. It's not to say that you know, the, the test and evaluation compromise isn't going to materialize into something a lot worse because it's in your network, uh, but uh, you know, the bleeding may be there, so it might be wise to start there. History also tells you, uh, can, can, inform, can, can inform you in a couple of ways. First, if you can relate to the thing you're seeing today to the thing you saw yesterday and the thing you saw the week before last, 
It's part of your analysis may be already done to the degree that there's similarity between what you saw today to what you saw last week. So if you have to do reverse engineering, good thing, you know, you may have done part of that analysis already. If, uh, uh, if it's a particular actor you've seen before, you know that it's one, two, three that they do through organization. So you may have found two. So now you just need to go look to two, two and three. So it's a little bit less, uh, less analysis. In other cases, it's a question of kind of priority. If you've seen a particular actor or a particular series of, of events cascade into something very bad, you should clearly kind of start there. Uh, and you're only going to get that through being able to keep those historical baselines. And again, I'm going to go back to this notion of analysts being really important in your organization. They, if they understand the business processes, they're going to be your best sensors to find kind of those anomalies and make some of those judgment calls because a lot of what I just talked about, you can try to kind of codify it in kind of some sim tool with, with work plans and kind of measures and you need to do all of that because again, that's a triage process, but there is going to be some expert judgment and your analysts are going to be, are going to be the best ones to use that expert judgment. So with some of the line of questioning, I mean, I was teed up a little bit about uh, about kind of process and technology ad adoption. I I'm sure I'm sure a, a lot of you listening to this are very familiar with uh, with with the, with the two uh, the kind of the two things I often see in in ops organizations. It's the shiny object syndrome, which is I really could do my job if I had insert widget from the interesting product. Uh, and the the other one that uh, the, the, that is often seen is I have six analysts but seven different tools to do the same thing, and each one of those analysts does something very very different. So I'm not saying that you know an, an idea to put all the data you have is, from from all your host based and network based sensors in some no SQL store, or and I'm not saying you don't want to build an entire kind of process around kind of the latest sim or sim that you can buy. What I'm saying is that you need to kind of step back when you're making those technology choices and you can, you can, you can take those technology choices and ultimately bind them to some process that you're doing and understand, you know, there's a defined workflow and you understand how that tech labels that work, helps in that workflow. The dirty little secret is a good analyst can probably do really reasonable things and find all sorts of bad things with almost any kind of reasonable set of kind of technologies. Yes, there's differentiators between, uh, you know, this proxy and kind of that proxy. There may be an extra data field here and there. But in the aggregate, a good analyst, uh, you know, can find something regardless of which one, which one he uses. So kind of uh, you get, should be, as a manager, be somewhat reticent uh, if the analyst can't clearly articulate what the new feature is of this particular product that will enable, enable you as the operation to do something you haven't been able to do before. Now, uh, there'll, be a, there'll be a webinar after, uh, two after mine, to talk quite a lot about process, so I'm going to defer some of that conversation. But you know, one of the most uh, common questions I have as I kind of pull on this theme is, you know, for example, you've, you've labeled uh, up there on the slide is ITIL, RMM, and CMM. Well, Roman, which one of those should I choose? Well, my, my response to you is, if you're honestly asking which one of those you should choose, then the answer is, it doesn't matter which one you choose. Just choose one. If you're coming to me and saying, well, Roman, I already do ITIL and, you know, I just read the RMM model, kind of what's the difference? That's the discussion you should be having. So kind of step one, if you don't have a rigorous process, kind of with those measurements, uh, you're not kind of doing that measurement. Fine. Get that religion. Find that and kind of get started there. And uh, my, uh, feel free to ask my colleague after, uh, after me about some of the nuances about what to do after you've done that. Uh, the theme I've been hitting on the, these last couple slides is this idea of learn from where you've been before. So learn from the historical data. It will help you prioritize. The kind of the other thing to step back as you think about process uh, and you think about what I opened up with, which was setting the expectations uh, for your specific kind of customers. You, know, you built your particular SOC. You built, uh, you built processes associated with it. Can you clearly articulate really what threat you built them for? Uh, or have you built them around just best practices? So you've kind of downloaded some process, you've done what, con what, what the consultant has told you, and you're as good as everyone else. I mean, I would challenge you, if you have that mindset, to think a little deeper and think, really, what do you think can happen to you? What are the threats you're seeing? And build processes around that. Be able to say, with each new technology insertion, I am inserting that because I want to mitigate this thing I couldn't do before, or I am making this process a little bit more complicated because I am worried about this particular problem. And 
successful organizations can reason about it in that particular way when they talk about why they're rolling out a new process or why there's an initial investment. It's to mitigate some particular thing. And how reasonable you are in your belief that you should be facing that, that, that you're going to be facing that particular threat is going to come from one of two places. So first of all, you've been keeping, hopefully, because I've been talking about this, of course, uh, you know, that historical data. So you know what's been happening to you, and hopefully you're reacting to the things that are occurring to you and the new thing you're, you're changing based on the, the additional observations you're seeing about things you haven't seen before. And again, to earlier discussions, you're talking to your peers. So you may not be the first one to see a particular class of threat, but there should be a strong suspicion uh, that if your peers are seeing a particular threat, that you will be seeing it. And frankly, it's probably already happening to you. You just don't know it yet. Uh, so collaborating with your peers, even if you're, you're our competitors, again, back to the, some of the conversation about cyber intelligence. I mean, you're going to get that best cyber intel from peer organizations like you. So this is my other tech slide, uh, so to speak. And it's also one of the few slides I have that speaks with hard data. So you should, of course, uh, you'll be kind of doing patching. But as a SOC, you should be asking yourself, as we were talking about triage, you should also be asking yourself, you know, how can I make my job easier? How can I reduce the, the, wor the workload? Uh, so the one kind of data slide I, I have there for you is, uh, is some results that our vulnerability team gave me late last week. And it was really kind of an exploration of why you need to do a lot more than just patching, because the state of software is not great, as you can perhaps see in those results. So uh, the, the vulnerability team often looks at just software quality. And in this, this particular case, they were looking at various open source and commercial products. And to protect the, the guilty, they've been abstracted to what those actually are. Uh, but you know, really trust me when I say I am exceedingly confident that you have at least two of those right now loaded on your desktop. Uh, and, uh, and, and what they, they, they honestly looked at is taking basic fuzzing approaches and finding you know, whether they can crash it. And if they can crash it, you know, how exploitable were those crashes? And so kind of the scary numbers are that regardless of which piece of tech that they looked at, it was really only a question of time about how much investment they did in, in processing and how, uh, CPU, how many CPUs they had running and how long they ultimately ran them to find 5, 10, 15 exploitable vulnerabilities. So the major software houses are getting much better about the frontline products. It's, it's a lot harder to find exploitable vols in, in find exploitable kernel vulnerabilities, for example. But kind of downstream in terms of libraries, those are all dependencies that are in there, and they are very much kind of exploitable. And so to, to talk one particular figure, and I'm standing too far away, so I've got I to take a little, little bit of a look. So if you're asking me, you know, can we find some of those things quicker than what you described there? Uh, so the file, file rendering library, we spent uh, six cores running for a week uh, to find X number of exploitable vulnerabilities on the order of, I think it's about 15 or 16. We could have found that faster by honestly just throwing a little bit of CPU. So 42 cores in one day would have found it at the same time. And if you wanted to, uh, to lease some cloud services, you could have thrown a thousand cores at it and gotten the same results in an hour. So kind of finding those balls isn't hard. The question is, how is the SOC or you responding in your enterprise architecture to, you know, to, mit to mitigate some of that? And so some of the best practices we've seen SOCs influence into the knocks and the guys that manage machines are making sure you're doing pretty stringent application whitelisting and going through that time, uh, the, the, the time to kind of figure out what you can reasonably run on your desktop. As we think about network policies, organizations have a tendency when they have a lot of external partners to say, well, I mean, listen, we have a lot of external partners. We're just going to make these services publicly available. And that's a, it's a very understandable model. Organizations that actually took the time to say, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make this service publicly exposed. I will go through the slightly extra effort uh, to make to to make uh, to to make my business partner use VPNs, or that I'll re restrict things like IP address space. Yes, all of those uh, all of those particular technical controls can be circumvented in some way. But organizations that did that and went through that effort actually did see sufficient payoff uh, payoff for the effort it took to actually understand how they do how how they do and how they ran their business. Contrary to this idea that we want to have a flat network and we want everyone to access all the resources on the organization, we also found that organizations that segmented their network sufficiently and created enclaves inside their corporations and thought through the business processes that link the different business units 
uh, and you know, put the controls that they would typically put on the border inside the organization also found a really big kind of return in finding lateral movement uh, across their network. And uh, those organizations really felt it was, it was worth that, uh, that investment. Uh, so to lastly call out two particular pieces of tech, if you're not thinking hard about exploit mitigation, that's not part of how you build your baseline desktop configurations, absolutely you should take a look at the Microsoft Emmet tool. And you know, to, to kind of those vulnerability numbers, hopefully as you looked at those, you walked away thinking, wow, if the, if the organizations that are professional software development organizations that have lots of resources are still having these issues, I wonder about all that in-house stuff I'm doing, but wait, all that in-house stuff is, it's not publicly exposed, so I'm okay. Uh, I mean, hopefully you realize, don't think like that and really start applying some of the, some of the rigorous evaluation approaches, like uh, make sure you have some, you do continuous integration and you have, you're using fuzz, fuzz testing approaches. And earlier you're teaching your developers to apply kind of secure coding approaches. Uh, so the code is actually just starting off a little bit better. A key mindset uh, as you're thinking through your operation is, and I alluded to kind of this about where you find your, your security intelligence and what happens if someone else is, is, you know, is seeing a particular class of activity and you're not. One of the most common reasons why you're not is you haven't found it yet. So you, what you want to do is have a mindset of you are already kind of compromised. You just haven't found it yet. You don't want to create an operation that's largely... Uh, largely just working, you know, the things that pop out of your, that pop out of stock vendor signatures. So thinking, thinking success is I worked all the things that popped up in my SIM and, you know, I worked them in a reasonable amount of time. You probably should be doing more than that. So there's a sophistication curve that we've seen across organizations about how they look for bad things on their network. So the kind of at the beginning are organizations that just take the signatures that are pushed down to them from the vendor that's making the product. And again, this is a great start. You should, hopefully you're doing this already. Uh, organizations that have thought a little harder about this typically start contracting with other providers above and beyond the, the specific kind of vendors that gave them their tech to put a, a, to put a wider a wider to pull in a wider view of, of threat and this entails also working collaboratively with peer organizations and then kind of the last step in the sophistication is really giving your analyst time to, in a sense, generate new leads about bad things that are happening on their network. So it's not a matter of, I work this particular incident I already know about and I'm closing tickets. It's really saying, let's go find some new tickets that, we, that our existing sensing infrastructure isn't popping out. And doing so actually requires a particular caliber of analysts. So you need to be thinking about moving up that sophistication curve. It's about the training you largely give your analysts. And it's secondly, giving them time to really explore, you know, what, I, what I'm kind of saying there is the kind of the shape of the data. They are great sensors in understanding what's the deviation from normal because they're working things on the network kind of every day. We've also found a lot of success in retroactively looking at what's occurred. So the threat feeds are a very, very wide aperture about what's happening in lots of different organizations. You stepping back and saying, well, I thought I understood the scope of a particular compromise was these six boxes, but stepping backwards and saying, wow, so I have this threat feed. Well, like it looks related to what I investigated, are there you know, three or four or five more boxes that I didn't know that were previously compromised? So really going through your historical data and finding more indicators and reanalyzing your forensics and incident data based on new information is a really fruitful uh, way to find uh, you know, boxes that you previously didn't understand were, were compromised. And so again, I'm going to take a breath here and, and look towards Shane, uh, whether there are any questions about some of the things I've been talking about. Yeah, one came in from Tom from the last section, right as, what as we went back to, uh, to the presentation. But I can handle this one. He was asking, what were the SCI documents uh, that you referenced? One was the RMM, the Resilience Management Model, sure. which Dr. Nate, uh, Nader Mahaveri will be talking about later today. And please give him, our, give him all the hard questions about kind of how you best implement process in an organization. Absolutely. And the other one <clears throat> was the uh, CMMI for Services, which was recently transitioned to CMMI Institute, but officially a, a technical report from the SEI over the years. So those were those two documents. Um, then from Scott, we had, how do you see the role of quality assurance slash quality control in, uh, in internal organizations supporting cybersecurity efforts? Well, that is a broad question. Uh, <clears throat> part of it is uh, I don't fully understand the kind of the, the the scope of what would be a QA organization that can mean kind of lots of things. So I'll take the one that I can easily answer. Uh, 
it re relates to you know, quality assurance kind of is very, very much related to what I was been previously talking about. It's the repeatability of things and being able to industrialize the industrialize kind of the repeat delivery of the same thing. So coming up with metrics, it's, you know, it's part and parcel to understand how effective you are as a CSER. And one of the things that I'll talk a little bit about later is this concept of kind of cyber hygiene, understanding where processes are repeatedly failing or using those metrics that you have that are scoring different parts of your organization. You know, that's the place where you find hotspots and that's the place where you should be making kind of additional investment. As we talk about kind of QA, you know, QA and software, I mean, that is the, one of the big attack surfaces in addition to the kind of the human. So to the degree that you can, you can lock that up and, uh, and make your development process more rigorous to think about that, you will see, honestly, kind of less attacks or at least attacks in that, through that particular venue. Okay, so Ken, this one may be one from Nauter, but we're going to try you out too as, as well, Roman. Uh, how do we protect intellectual property and other sensitive business information while also encouraging collaboration and product development processes? Yes, that is a very broad question. <laughs> uh, so, so, I mean, part of it is, I mean, I'll, I'll, duck, uh, I'll duck and I'll be vague, uh, and I'll say talk, talk a little bit to Nader about this, but, I mean, they're, they're, every company has, has some set of IP they want to protect, and clearly everyone wants as many people to have access to it as, as humanly kind of possible. But uh, again, kind of part of it is you know, really thinking through what's, what's realistic and really thinking through who are those folks that are going to be looking at, at that IP. And it, it, to me, it comes down to coming up with the necessary technology and process kind of controls uh, that, your, first of all, your SOC understands where that key IP is. That SOC understands who is going to be looking at it, and you have sufficient, uh, sufficient tech and processes that you know, watch who's going to be coming to, to, those particular, uh, to those particular resources. So again, I pull, uh, I pull what I previously was talking about, network design. I mean, again, you shouldn't necessarily have a flat network. I mean, you should be able to segment departments and watch what's happening kind of between those. And when bad things do occur around those key data stores, your SOC your socks knows that those are the crown jewels, and they need to be focusing a lot of effort if something bad happens there. Okay, we'll fit one more here in this section from Eric asking, what has been the actual experience with EMET? In discussion, in discussion with Microsoft, EMET, while ultimately effective, is encumbered by the investment of tuning it to an environment. What is your experience regarding the tuning process? It is difficult. <laughs> uh, so, of course, I mean, and, and so I kind of appreciate that question because that, that calls, me to car, calls me on the carpet saying it's a lot harder than saying just use it. Absolutely. Uh, for a number of those pieces of tech that I mentioned, not just Emmet, things like application whitelisting, there is a huge investment that needs to be made about understanding what's actually running on the desktop. There's a significant number of issues kind of with legacy, legacy tech, and it's not as easy as just kind of rolling it out. Our personal experience with it is honestly exactly as I said. We found that organizations kind of struggle sometimes because of, because of the legacy apps, and a lot of the the work is we've directly been engaged uh, on thinking about exploit mitigation. It's been helping organizations better segment the the things that are harder to defend into perhaps virtualized environments and moving them into places where they are there is some kind of protective wrapper put around them because the apps themselves can't easily be defended and coming up with an architecture that, that supports that. But that's, that's kind of a, a great observation. It's, it's not as easy as just saying kind of flick it on. Okay, we're all caught up with questions. Questions, so next slide. Okay. So very much related to, uh, to kind of the, the previous th thread about assuming you're already compromised, so you just haven't found it yet, is this idea of, and I loathe to even use this word, but it's the P of, of advanced persistent threat of APT. The observation to make is most of the sophisticated stuff you're going to find is not going to be when it just started. It's, it's very much after the fact. It's typically in the middle of the event. Kind of an, another scenario to kind of think about is, you know, you got a call from the, the local FBI uh, office, and they said, well, Roman, your company is participating in a denial service attack. Stop it. How prepared are you as an organization to be to really kind of figure out what actually happened why you're participating in this denial of service attack, or fully understanding the scope of what's occurring on your network when you finally uh, find some, some intrusion there. And kind of the key we found is you need to have retrospective data. 
significant investing in, in, uh, in blocking and tackling at various kind of proxies, IPS, all of that is exceedingly helpful. But in addition to kind of the real time, the quasi real time view, you also need to have the ability to look backwards. So investing significant resources in, for example, keeping NetFlow around for long periods of time and kind of your, your budget will determine and kind of your risk tolerance will, will, will determine how long to keep it. But keeping it for six months or a year is not unheard of uh, with, with some of the organizations we work with. Keeping things like passive DNS, which speaks to where the command and control is for much longer periods of time, given that it's small, is really helpful. And having some ability to have ground truth, that is having some rolling PCAP buffer, on, you know, based on the, you know, whatever amount of money you're willing to spend on kind of said buffer because it's going to be expensive. You know, at least having some ability uh, to do that. And then ultimately crafting policies around that. If you know that your PCAP buffer is only three days back, make sure that whatever escalation procedures you have can react within that time window because a lot of key data, for example, is going to be gone. And so this is back to this idea of you, know, you should tie your workflow and your process to the tech investment you know, that you've made. As you think about fielding the sensors, uh, two, big, two big considerations. Uh, first, you want to always have the real IP addresses of what's happening. And that typically means if you're behind proxies and NATs, you want to have the inside address. You can accomplish that by keeping logs for a really long time. You can accomplish that by you know, doing instrumentation at various points in the network. Uh, the other kind of key thing is you think about sensor deployment uh, and, and ultimately you know, what visibility it has in the, in the network don't forget lateral communication. I mean, it's one thing to watch your, watch your perimeter. It's another thing to kind of watch, again, your perimeter with kind of business partners. But make sure you can watch the, you know, what's moving through your organization, even if it doesn't leave. That's a great way to catch kind of insider threat. And some of the more sophisticated threat, all the, all the compromised boxes will not beacon out. They will beacon to resources that are fielded in, fielded in your network. So without that class of instrumentation, you're blind to quite a lot of activity. And kind of at the bottom there is I have some links to some of the network gap network analysis tools that we have built for some of our customers. Kind of bringing it together a little bit, and I, I, I alluded to it earlier, you know, there's, a, there's this concept in criminology about broken windows. It comes from, from I believe, the, the early 80s. And the idea is that escalation occurs, so petty crime, vandalism, will turn into much more serious crime if left unchecked. In our context, it's this notion of, you know, honestly sweating the small stuff. So looking at policy violations that, that occur, are there patterns about where it occurs? I mean, are there places where passwords routinely expire? Are there places where routinely patches are not applied? Use that as a sensor in your overall organization to understand, you know, why is that occurring? Understanding, is it kind of a network design issue? Is it an issue where, frankly, more investment needs to be made? Uh, you know, I was talking quite a lot how you, one wants to hunt in an organization. I mean, that's probably, those are probably places where you'd want to start looking for where, where, where bad stuff is happening. And organizations that don't treat anything too small, again, it's, a, it's really kind of a philosophy and it's an intensive philosophy, have found, uh, found some return here. And, you know, the most important thing when you talk about sweating, sweating the details, it really is, it's about accountability and how organizations have held ultimately management accountable where business units, uh, business units are turning out to be particular hotspots. So kind of an example, in organizations where centralized SOC and incident response services don't cost individual departments, I mean, we saw just a simple chargeback process where, uh, where departments have to ultimately pay for it, pay for the cleanup, changed, changed behavior. We've seen public shaming, frankly, work. This idea of scoring network elements and department owners don't want to have a low score when they look at their peers. And really the nuclear option is, you know, how senior management kind of responds to those different incentives to, to, uh, to promote cyber hygiene and how well they're integrated. But, you know, success really for us has been, you know, there's individual accountability when, and it, sometimes it makes sense where an individual network owner says, I'm not doing, doing what is the best practice. And they own kind of the risk associated with it. But there's typically a business driver and having the flexibility to, to have them assume the risk for uh, honestly, uh, you know, delaying what might be kind of the right action. So having a construct that thinks about that uh, often makes SOCs really successful. Uh, so really, to, to the, the last theme that I wanted to, to talk uh, about is, uh, is kind of what, we, what you'll see in almost is the definition of a SOC for kind of a lot of places. It's really, what's your big board look like? 
So any organization that's spinning up a SOC needs to make a very, very important decision. Are they going to be a CNN organization or are they going to be a Fox organization? On their you know, left panel or are they going to put it on the middle panel? And of course, the other very key decision one needs to make is, well, you're going to put the big map up somewhere. Uh, again, which screen are you going to put the big map and is it going to be spinning? And what are the highlighting colors you're going to use associated with that? So, you know, kind of in all seriousness, I'm kind of tongue in cheek a little bit. Uh, Common, the, the, the common operational picture is, is a recurring thing we see organizations kind of want to build. And for the most part, organizations really struggle to, to do this. And kind of where organizations have a tendency to stumble uh, as they think about a COP is they think COP equals visualization, right? So this is about presenting the right viz. It's not really about the right viz. Organizations sometimes kind of struggle. Well, the, the COP is supposed to be the common view. It's the pervasive view. But the problem is they haven't put the hard work in getting their own organization to play together, and there's a perception that investment in tech will solve business processes. It's really not going to do that. Uh, and then kind of the, the last observation where folks, folks kind of struggle with this is where they make it, uh, the, the COP, a very, technically, a very technical kind of artifact where it's not speaking about the business, it's speaking about some very technical artifact. So what sometimes makes me cringe a little bit is when we talk about kind of big displays and you know, C CEOs or, 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 or top level officers are looking at something where we have lots of lists of IP addresses. Global organizations should be looking at individual, individual kind of IP addresses. So kind of the, the challenge in the successful practice is, and I'm sure I'll, I'll get some questions on that, is you know, it's the ability to define metrics that are meaningful to your business. Is it your ability to talk about revenue loss is something I've seen uh, successful kind of cops, uh, cops explore. Is it the ability to kind of talk about which, which collections of missions are degraded in some particular way? Uh, and those are and organizations that have done things like that have again successfully thought about a, a couple of things meaningfully what are the decision makers the, the senior folks need to have in front of them they've thought hard about aligning the business processes to get the data they need to kind of feed that and they've thought lastly about how you trend how do you learn from the history so as they define metrics they think about you know how do I turn this into a historical view so I have some sense of whether I'm getting better or worse and in implementing these metrics, they've also thought about how, how those metrics are meaningful throughout the organization. So how someone at, the, at, uh, at a leaf, or, leaf element of an organization, what, does the, what are their roles and responsibilities in that metric as it kind of rolls up? The, one, of the, the, one of the last things uh, the, working with some DOD senior officers has kind of taught me is, you know, it's about judgment as well. So as much as we want to get empirical things, uh, empirical kind of measures of kind of where we stand, we want to leave an opportunity for the person really m moving the business forward to make the judgment call, uh, you know, the, the number, you know, a particular metric. And again, I'm not going to kind of assign, uh, assign kind of meaning to it. I mean, if it says four, for certain, certain business managers, they're going to be a little more uh, risk tolerant. And they're going to say if four is good enough for me. For others, uh, you know, for, for a more risk averse uh, individual, they may say, ooh, I needed a five before I can move forward. And so again, the number doesn't mean anything, but, but as kind of senior leaders look at that, they need to have kind of confidence that the number got generated in a way that they understand so they can make the subjective call from their particular experience about how to ultimately interpret that number. So to pull it all together, uh, kind of bring it a little bit to, to closure here, you know, the takeaways from, uh, from my talk, again, is that in no way should you implement everything I said. Uh, some of the things I've kind of pointed out actually may not make sense for the class of security operation you run. They may not make sense for the scale that, that you're running. And some of what I said is actually contradictory because of those two things. But kind of the, the recurring tenants are, if all you're doing is watching what your stock signatures are popping out of your network, you need to be hunting for things. You need to be more actively searching for compromise on your network. If you have two, if you have an insular view where you're just relying on kind of your own organization to tell you what's happening, that uh, means you're also missing a, you're, you're missing key opportunities to understand uh, understand kind of the threat that your organization is facing. So work with your external partners, come up with reasonable processes. So when bad things do happen, you have an ability to ultimately reach out to them, and that they proactively feed you better insight into what they're seeing, and you can apply that into your operation. 
build historical repositories that ultimately help you triage and prioritize what you do in ops based on what you've seen. And don't miss a key opportunity to understand what you should be buying and how you should be redesigning the network based on your, the entirety of your historical experience. Don't make it about best practices or whatever is kind of the new shiny vendor, vendor item that's being kind of sold to you. Look at what's happened to you and kind of respond in that way. And probably the most important thing out of everything and anything I've kind of talked about is the recognition that your analysts, there's no, I mean, there's no substitute for them. You can make the best tech investment uh, without good analysts, you are going to really under underutilize that tech. Without processes, yes, your your analysts, uh, uh, your analysts will be you will be kind of somewhat successful. But ultimately, what you want to be doing is, is investing in the people and kind of that, that human capital in your organization, and they in the end kind of make the best sensors, and they will glue together any shortcomings you have in your tech and your processes. Okay, so that's the conclusion uh, of my talk. And so there's a few minutes to kind of pull together any questions from anything that inspired you from as we kind of uh, came along or if anyone kind of wants to dive into some of those details. So Shane? Great. Uh, just, uh, again, a couple questions coming in about um, where to get the slides. They're in the resource widget now, folks. You can download um, a PDF version of all the presentations here this morning and, and walk away with them. Uh, from Lawrence asking, where does an InfoSec analyst go to learn uh, how to incorporate best business practices across the spectrum of data security. After all, the bottom line is what really counts at the end of the day. Got it. So there's a, there's a couple ways I, get, I think to think about the problem. Where I've seen kind of some of those, so I, I've alluded kind of this uh, this this mythical kind of senior analyst as kind of the, the the really clutch part of kind of your operation. So what makes him a senior analyst? The, my experience is that, you know, there, there was kind of the whole kind of tech side of it. I mean, how well do, does he actually know network protocols? How well does he know operating systems? How well does he know the security kind of technologies? I mean, that's an important kind of dimension to it, and that is a key element to it. But really what, what transforms an analyst into that senior guy is not just knowing the tech. It's actually knowing the business. It's his ability to to really engage and have a meaningful non-techy conversation with a business owner, a guy that owns a piece of a network, to say, you know, to understand what that guy is doing, and then that senior analyst has the ability to distill the the kind of the specific kind of business goals into the tech that they have on their network, and has the ability to kind of talk about if bad things happen, what might be the impact to the business, and ultimately understanding kind of forward thinking. Wow, based on that experience, I know what we're doing tech wise. We need to be thinking differently. So where does that expertise ultimately come? I mean, it comes from talking with the non techies. It comes to talking with the business, uh, the kind of the business owners, kind of. The themselves and being able to use their language and not bring bring things like IP addresses to the conversation is kind of a key part and just being able being able to listen to that. Okay, great. Uh, from Tim asking, are there some model socks in the DoD where we can learn from good things they've done? Uh, so. I, so I'd prefer to kind of take that question kind of a little bit offline. If if there are folks in the government that specifically kind of want to talk about that. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to kind of start uh, kind of pointing out kind of model socks. I think really it's there's best practices we can talk about offline uh, that have occurred in, in some of those different organizations. Okay, uh, from Eric again on the well trained note. What is your view of the, of the differences and synergies between analysts and responders? Hmm. Yeah, that's that's uh, honestly kind of a, a, an interesting question. Uh, so one of the one of kind of the observations, and we, we in a sense kind of have that the same kind of construct in our own team, is it's, it comes down to sometimes how close that, that, that technical either analyst or responder is to the problem itself. And that kind of suggests the, the timeliness of certain things. One of the things that the first responder is most concerned about, and I believe the speaker after me is going to be talking a lot about this, is it's, it's about the about the velocity and the speed of the investigation. So the responder is is typically focused on one very particular thing, and they're trying to kind of find out whatever will help them continuing the, the investigation. Analysts, in my kind of experience, and not to say these, these are mutually exclusive kind of things, analysts typically have the luxury of, you know, they're typically further removed. They're not the ones uh, that are on the flyaway. And... Uh, uh, and kind of as a consequence, they may actually be kind of working perhaps kind of multiple things. And the relationship between the first responders, at least in our organization, and analysts themselves is 
the first responders need to be generalists. They typically don't know what they're going to encounter. Analysts, especially kind of good ones over time, have a tendency to specialize in something. So those analysts are great reach back for generalists that honestly have to even know where to start and have a, a, a broad breadth of experience. So they may start in the same place, but over time they have a tendency to generalize. Uh, to, I'm sorry, to specialize. Okay, about a minute left, so we get, uh, I'd like to get to two more questions from Mike asking, does avoiding DNS and using only host files significantly enhance the security of the system? Does it significantly harm the security diagnostics if needed? Uh, that's a, it's an interesting question. So I don't actually have a lot of data on... Uh, on kind of networks that would completely abandon DNS from an ops management perspective, it would seem really problematic. And in hurting ops, you're really going to be hurting security because you may be impacting your ability to, to actually manage everything that's occurring. And I think this is a two-word question here from Gordon. What organiza some organizations can't acquire the best and brightest and must deal with the people that they have. How does this work with a less skilled workforce? Repeatable processes. So you can do handover and turnover from analyst to analyst. And I would suggest CERT training as well. Absolutely. Okay, Roman, great job. Thank you very much.